I'm State Senator Stan Rosenberg, and my guest today is Kevin Sullivan. Kevin lives in Westfield, lived there his whole life. He's an attorney out of Springfield, and now he's becoming quite famous because he's a candidate for governor's council on the September 6th primary ballot. And by the way, September 6th is not Tuesday. We're used to voting on Tuesday. September 6th is Thursday. We had to change the law this year for the primary because of a number of reasons. So uh, not important for the show, but please remember to vote on September 6th, which is Thursday, not on the usual Tuesday. So uh, Kevin, tell us uh, what the Governor's Council does and why you're running for it. Well, thank you. And first of all, thank you, Senator, for coming out and giving me the opportunity and Amherst Cable for allowing me to come out and introduce myself to some of the people of Hampshire County. Governor's Council is a primary role, is to approve or reject the governor's uh, nominations, judicial nominations at the clerk level, judge level, all the way up to the Supreme Judicial Court. Potentially 500 nominees coming in front of the council. The work is done on Wednesdays down in Boston. It appeals to me specifically because I have been a practicing attorney with uh, offices in Springfield and Westfield uh, for the past 21 years. So I've been out around these districts. The 8th District, which is the Governor's Council District I'm running for, is made up of 96 cities and towns. The majority of the Franklin, Hampshire, um, Berkshire, and Hamden counties. So it's large area, obviously various courts from the housing court level to the district courts, superior courts, all through the counties. Having been in those courts on a regular basis, a daily basis, I understand what it takes to staff those with qualified people, and I think that uniquely makes me qualified to be on the Governor's Council at this point. So Tom Merrigan, the incumbent, decided not to run for re-election after a couple of successful terms. So is there something in particular that's driving you other than wanting to see good appointees in the courts and the appellate tax board? And uh, I think you also do notaries Correct. and uh, and a few other kinds of functionaries like that. So uh, what what's motivating you to uh, throw your hat in the ring here? Primarily, it is just continuing, actually, the work Tom Merrigan's done. He's, he was on the council for six years, and the first conversation I had with him was his explanation that this job really is defending Western Mass, defending the turf. The 8th District makes up 25% of the land mass of Massachusetts. We only have one-eighth of the voting power. So it's really defending the area, and I think I'm uniquely qualified to do that again because I've been out in these courts. I've been throughout the communities. I understand that the, cha the differences between the, the smaller local district courts and the superior courts in Springfield, Northampton, Franklin County, and I think, again, I, I have a, a passion for making sure we get the qualified people from the area into those jobs. And just like Tom did, I think I, I can fulfill that need for Western Massachusetts. So you're not really just a, uh, an employment service, meaning uh, a uh, group of people that takes a look at the candidates uh, from the point of view of human resources as though you were filling a job in a corporation somewhere. It's a very sensitive subject. Where are you on some of the key issues and what would you be looking for in judge uh, candidates for judgeships that our constituents here in Western Massachusetts uh, would be uh, concerned about and, and be assured that you're looking at these things in the right way. Absolutely. I'm a lifelong Democrat, very proud to say I've been a lifelong Democrat, and I will obviously continue those values. So issues such as workers' rights, such as gay marriage, such as equality in the workplace are, are huge and have been the cutting edge of the judicial uh, courts in Massachusetts over the years. Obviously, up at the Supreme Judicial Court level, Massachusetts has made some cutting edge decisions that have impacted the country. Mm -hmm. And I am certainly in favor of what those rulings were. I look forward to continuing to staff the Supreme Judicial Court, the appellate courts, the people who are making those huge policy decisions with the qualified democratic values. And that's what I'd be looking for when we get to those levels. Little different when you're talking about the district courts and even the superior courts. You need the, you need the judges and the clerks who understand how to get things done in a courthouse, how to move a docket, how to abide by the sentencing rules that the state legislature has applied. And at that point in time, you're looking at the qualified candidates. But again, even with the sentencing guidelines that the judges have a little bit of latitude, you've got to look for those good, strong democratic values and to 
adhere to what the state legislature is putting out there. So isn't Massachusetts one of the few states in the country that has a process for naming judges that looks like ours, that is, the governor makes nominations to an elected body of governor's counselors as opposed to a state senate, for example, or the whole legislature or a judiciary committee. So uh, what's your take on uh, how this system works in Massachusetts? And uh, just looking down the road, do you think that this is the best system? Do you think we should have judges for life? Do you think that there ought to be something outside of the internal judicial review for quality and uh, and I guess there is a process to remove a judge but Correct. it's not very easy and it's insular and it's inside the system as opposed to uh, some body outside that's uh, accountable to the voters. Yeah, correct. They are judicial, lifetime judicial appointments which obviously make them very important decisions. Massachusetts is one of only two states that has a governor council, a separate body from the legislature that is making these uh, interviews and final um, votes on these appointments. My position is there needs to be some body, there needs to be some backstop to an administrator's um, nominees for judicial appointment. Okay, In Massachusetts I think it's worked very well being the governor's council. If the people of Massachusetts ultimately vote that hey it can be handled by the state senate, that's their prerogative. But there has to be some mechanism in place to interview and to vet these different judicial nominees because again they're lifetime positions. I do not think we should go like other states and, and move towards electing of judges. I do like the fact that lifetime, but it does put a, a burden and an onus on those interviews at the governor's council level. Hmm. Is there a compromise between lifetime and uh, elections? Uh, I'm open to suggestions. Personally, I like the lifetime if we wanted to do it as a set of years where the judge gets reviewed, a 10-year slot where you're going to come up for review in front of a board at some point in time. That's certainly something, again, in working in connection with the legislature that we could look at. At this point, it is the lifetime. I, I would not go to a straight election of the judges. I think that creates more problems. Than I agree solves. with you 100 percent on the, on the election. It really makes it much too political and then it's driven by uh, who's behind you, who's uh, giving you the money, right. and uh, they're making judgments based upon your judgments uh, as a judge and uh, that it seems to me is really problematic. Mm -hmm. So um, people sometimes talk about litmus tests in the appointing of judges. Mm -hmm. Do you have a set of things that might constitute a litmus test? Well again, the first, the first test is the qualifications. The experience of the candidate, the qualifications of the candidate, and especially depending on which job we are looking to fill at that What kind of experience time. would you be looking for? Again, if you're talking about a superior court judge, and if the residents of Hampshire County have ever seen a superior court trial, you understand that that judge has to make tens and hundreds of decisions split second, especially if it's a jury trial. Judge has to know the law, has to be able to make those type of decisions, has to make them correctly, and has to be able to continue to move that case and move that docket. Again, when you're talking about the district court level, it's more um, steak and potatoes, if you will, where you got to get things moving, you got to get the docket moving, you got to get the jobs right, you got to get the right decision so you don't run into issues. But you're looking at different personalities. When you get up to the SJC, you obviously need to know people who've got proper theory and understand the law and understand what their rulings are going to create. And I think it's a, it's a different, um, different uh, criteria at each of those mm -hmm. levels. Obviously the clerks are completely different in that they have to understand and have some experience with managing a courtroom and management experience will come into play. Having said that, again, lifelong Democrat, my values have not changed over the years so I certainly will be taking into consideration once you got the qualifications is how are you going to rule, especially at the upper levels where you're making policy. Uh, the court system has been under scrutiny for a while now as a result of the uh, so-called probation scandal. Mm -hmm. So um, how do you see approaching and what kinds of criteria do you set in terms of looking at clerks given that many of the uh, candidates who will apply for clerks will have worked in an office, a clerk's office, mm -hmm many will not have worked in a clerk's office. They may be an attorney who's worked outside. Right. So how are you going to balance uh, the experience that you talked about a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. the knowledge of the law, and how much does the knowledge of the law fit into the question of who gets appointed to clerks? And how will you deal with the uh, sort of the perception of the, of the patronage-laden 
court system. Understood. I think the biggest concern with clerks is that they understand the area they're working in. If you're in one of these rural district courts, you have got to understand your clientele. You have got to understand the type of matter that you're going to be deciding on a day-to-day -day basis. Therefore, when you're coming in front of the Governor's Council, after you've already been vetted by the Judicial Nominating Committee, you're going to come in front of us and we're going to have to make sure you understand that community. Again, I'd like to have the local people in those jobs because they understand that community. As far as the patronage and the issues, you've got to look at the experience of the person. You've got to look at, at where the person has come from, what experience they've had, whether it be judicial management from the clerk's position, people that they've worked under and, and have been in charge of, and making sure that they can handle that courtroom because, again, Everyone in the community at some point in time is going to have a connection with the courts. Maybe jury trial, um, just a yeah, jury trial, or it may be jury duty, it may be one of the probate or housing court matters. They want to be able to go into that courtroom and get treated fairly, get treated quickly, and get a just result. And that's going to, a lot of that's going to depend on how the clerks move things. So one of the other appointees uh, or a series of appointments that you guys deal with would be the appellate tax board. Mm -hmm. So can you explain to the viewers what the Appellate Tax Board does and what you'd be looking for in terms of the qualifications of people for that position? Again, very specific job. So it's someone who has to understand the law, has to understand the tax system, which is never easy, and has to understand how to move matters, how to move a case, how to properly adjudicate a case. So you're limiting your pool when you get that specific to a job. So you've got to come in with a resume that shows that you understand how judicial tax matters work. Again, the applications for that may be much fewer than some of these other positions, but you've, again, it's going to boil down to understanding the material, the experience, and then again, how ultimately you're going to be able to handle the courtroom. Great. And uh, on a slightly political matter here, so there's been a certain amount of fireworks at the uh, Governor's Council yeah. in the last few years, yeah. and uh, changing in the composition of some of the membership has really brought some uh, really interesting dynamics and we're in the final two years heading into the final two years of uh, Governor Patrick's uh, governorship okay. so um, how do you see the next two years on the governor's council uh, what are you looking for what role do you want to play in terms of uh, uh, how the council operates and do you see any potential differences given that the governor's in his final two years in terms of how that body's going to operate and what you would uh, be asking the governor to do. Absolutely. Again, the governor's already announced he's not seeking re-election. So he's got a couple of years left. I expect the f next two years, the first term I would serve, would be very busy. He's going to want to put his stamp on the judiciary across the state. The only time you've read about the governor's council in the last couple of years is when one of their meetings turns into a circus down in Boston and the, and the members start sniping at each other. There's going to be at least three new members of the council going into uh, next session. My hope is obviously to bring some integrity, some competence, some accountability to that staff. Tom Merrigan's done a very nice job, but he's had his hands full dealing with some of these members. So I, I believe I'm on the chairman of the school committee in Westfield, which gives you a little bit of an idea of what you have to do to get along. You have to yeah. be able to compromise with people and you have to be able to run a meeting properly. It's, there's obviously political agendas that some of the other councils have been trying to drive into the governor's council, um, making sure the lieutenant governor is always handling the meetings and, and uh, trying to keep the governor in Boston to, in case he's needed in mm -hmm. order to break a tie. Some of these political things need to be looked at and, and maybe taken out of the process if possible and just kind of get back to the sanity and get back to what we're there for, and that's to approve or reject the nominees that are put in front of us. Great. Well, in the final minute, do you want to uh, make any kind of closing uh, comment about your candidacy and uh, what you hope to accomplish here? I will. And thank you again for giving me the opportunity out here in Amherst to get to meet the people. Someone asked me the other day what the best part of the uh, election has been in, in this whole campaign, and it's been meeting the people. It's been getting out and getting to know not only the citizens, but the elected officials. And I've gotten some great support. DA Dave Sullivan and Mark Mastriani, the sheriffs across the counties, including Chris, including Chris Donnellan up in Franklin County, and then the legislative delegation, yourself and uh, Senator Candaris, and Senator Downing, and then you get down to, to Peter Coca and, and, and Representative Scheibel, Mack, and, and Ellen Story has been nice here in Amherst. Getting to know those people has been fantastic, and getting to get the ear and their ideas 
as we move forward on what the Governor's Council can do is impressive. Again, I'm looking to bring accountability, integrity, competence to this position. It's one I'd really like to do. I think I'm the most qualified with the legal background. And again, on September 6th, I would ask the people of Amherst and of Hampshire County for their vote. Well, thank you very much for taking time to come and speak uh, through ACTV with uh, our friends here in Amherst and uh, beyond as this uh, tape may find its way in other places. So uh, thank you for joining us and please remember to vote on Thursday, September 6th for the primary and then again on Tuesday, November 6th in the general election. A lot at stake in this election and it's up to us to collectively to decide our future through those elections. Thank you.